Latvian state police arrest suspect in Bunkus murder case, businessman Mikhail Oman. The case is now based on the section of the criminal law regarding murder committed in especially aggravating circumstances by an organized group of people. This crime is punishable with lifelong prison sentence or 15 to 20 years in prison. Rago trade insolvency was the only act of insolvency procedure in which Bunkus was the administrator. Entrepreneur Mikhail Oman has been on the list of Latvian millionaires for many years. Police have arrested the assets of businessmen Mikhail Oman and Alexandra Babenko. In both cases the assets have been arrested to ensure the financing of procedural costs and compensations to the injured parties, as well as confiscation of property as a possible additional penalty. Greetings, dear viewer. As you may have already guessed, I am the author of this film. And I am not a human being, but, artif Ar Ar but artificial intelligence. Yes, don't be surprised. Technology is advancing. And today you can quickly and easily create any fake video, replicate an any vo voice, and even any signature, such as yours, for example, that is indistinguishable from the real thing. The former head of the German Federal Intelligence Service, August Hanning, and former NATO chief, Anders Volk Rasmussen, faced multi-million dollar lawsuits. The central bank was induced not to intervene by bribing the Latvian Justice Minister and the chairman of the legal committee. Latvia is an arena of dark machinations, this is where money from dark Russian channels has been flowing into the EU banking system for 30 years. This is where North Korea launders and hides billions. The head of the central bank and other supervisory bodies continued to ignore this. An audacious attack in broad daylight in the middle of live traffic clearly conveyed a message. The perpetrators chose broad daylight, a public place close to the National Police and the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Although, as professionals, they could have done it inconspicuously. One of the most probable versions of the murder is related specifically to the permission and disapproval of the liquidation of ABLV Bank. In theory, the liquidators of ABLV Bank have the possibility of access to 400 million euros. Many of those who agreed to be interviewed for our documentary series refused at the last moment, fearing the consequences. But those who are not afraid will tell you who Mikhail Ullman is and what lies behind his arrest. Richard Sucks. Director and shareholder of European Hit Radio, the largest media group in Europe. Manages EHR, EHR Superhits and EHR Russian Hits radio stations with a weekly audience of 504,000 unique listeners. Richard Zucks as Copar partner. My name is Richard Zucks, together with my partners I run the European Hit Radio Media Group, which has always had the number one license in independent Latvia. I have only good things to say about Mikhail Abramovich Holman. I met him a long time ago when I went and tried to get a loan from him. He managed to talk me out of it and we have been friends ever since. I could always go to him and ask for some advice and he always found time, despite being a busy man in a big structure, always giving me time, sharing his advice, which was quite valuable to me. It is difficult for me to say where this situation stands or where the truth lies. I can only say what I know personally. Personally, I know him as a very good person who treated me very well. I hope that with time everything will become clear. But considering that the situation is difficult not only for Mr. Ullman personally, but also for Mago, Lataco Lizings, and all the other entities with which we are working successfully. I know that it is a difficult situation for their managers, for their staff, and that is why I want to give him my best. Sergei Lukashin Individually practicing sworn lawyer. Ullman was not personally acquainted with Martin Bunkus, never communicated with him, not even by phone, the case was handled by lawyers. I was Mikhail Ullman's lawyer only in some part of the Rago trade insolvency process. Rago Trade became insolvent in 2008, that was exactly the time of the global economic crisis. Ullman at one point, at the request of the other two board members, as he told me, gave this company a loan. 
there was an agreement between the board members where the division of responsibilities was carried out. And in fact, Ullman did not have any powers or competences at all. When the company started to have problems, the assets of the company and all the stock were sold. Ullman got his money back, but not all the other creditors did. As part of the insolvency proceedings, the administrator filed suit against Ullman to recover the loan amount of 256,000 lats returned to Ullman. Under commercial law, all three members of the board, that is all of the company's board members, are collectively liable to the company's creditors. Accordingly, it turns out that Ullman's presence on the board meant that he could also be liable for obligations to creditors. That is, whatever the other board members have done, Ullman was also responsible for it. So insolvency administrator Martin Spunkus evaluated and felt that several lawsuits should be filed against the board members. Separate lawsuit against Ullman, which I've already mentioned, was about the repayment of the loan amount returned. There were suits separately against the other board members to recover from them the amount of debts they owed the company, and there were suits against all the board members to recover damages. Ullman paid the amount that was ordered from all the board members in full. According to the court, liability is joint in several, meaning that one can claim the appropriate amount from anyone. And, since Ullman was here in Latvia and had quite a lot of assets and money, accordingly, it was easiest to collect this money from him. The company also claims that Ullman had no direct conflict with Martin Spunkus. All civil cases related to the insolvency of Ullman's partly owned company Rago Trade were resolved through legal means. Moreover, the civil proceedings that had already been initiated before the murder of Martin Spunkus were concluded in favor of Ullman and the judgments entered into force in favor of Ullman. By the date of the crime, some of the proceedings against Martin Spunkus had been concluded. Two other proceedings were at a procedural stage where Martin Spunkus could no longer significantly influenced the course of the litigation, and by that point Martin Spunkus had already made all possible arguments, allegations, and requests to the court, Mono stated in a press release. At the time of Bunkus' death, the Riga District Court dismissed the lawsuit, the amount of the claim was about 1,333,000 euros that Bunkus had asked to recover as damages from the members of the Rago Trade Board. In this case the court proceedings of the second instance were completed and Martin Spunkus has already filed a cassation appeal. However, a few days before Bunkus was murdered, a twist occurred in one of the trials, following a Supreme Court decision, Ullman was able to get back 721,186 euros, that is the Senate ordered a retrial because Bunkus was not open enough about some documents, de facto reported. After the lawyer was killed, the insolvency proceedings of Rago Trade were taken over by the administrator Novitsuns. After losing the reopened case in the first instance, he chose not to litigate further with Ullman because there were documents that could be translated in Ullman's favor. We have to understand that appealing a verdict is not a sport. We have to appeal against those judgments which we see as unlawful at a given moment. Novitsuns now explains his decision not to prosecute further. After the unfavorable verdict against Rago Trade, Novitsuns had to pay back 721,186 euros to Ullman, but he could not pay back all of it because Bunkus had already paid himself remuneration out of this money. There was a third case in which Ullman and other board members were charged 721,000 euros. A little before the verdict of the appellate court came into force, we had new information. This is what served as newly discovered circumstances for the reversal of that verdict. Ullman had already paid the fees, he had already said goodbye to the money. This case consisted globally in the fact that Martin Spunkus asked to recover damages from Ullman and other Rago Trade board members in connection with transactions between Rago and Rago Trade. Martin Spunkus argued that Rago, which was also insolvent, had not repaid the debt to Rago Trade and therefore the board was responsible. We argued that this money had been repaid and proved it with the evidence we had. Our opponents, Martin Spunkus himself and the lawyers he engaged, they pointed out that the evidence we were putting forward, it was the tax returns, the data we managed to get, that this evidence was insufficient. And they asked us to provide waybills, which showed that Rago delivered the goods in question to Rago Trade and, accordingly, 
repaid the debt that was owed to him. That is, the waybills proved the delivery of the goods. These waybills were not in Omen's possession. First of all, Omen, as I have already said, was not involved in the Rago trade process, and he held the position of the board basically in order to control the repayment of the debt to himself. Secondly, he never had anything to do with the papers either, he had no waybills. It was an interesting fact that the other members of the board had no papers too, because when the insolvency occurred they simply left the office of Rago Trade and left all the papers in the office. Martin Bunkus came and took these documents himself. There was the police who also came to the office of Rago Trade and took away some of the documents as well. Those and other documents of Rago Trade were in the possession of Martin Bunkus. As soon as we found out that there were such documents, we immediately started talking about newly discovered circumstances. These documents were turned over to the court. And in one of the folders were these very documents of transactions between Rago and Rago Trade, which Martin Bunkus, the administrator, asked to provide. The point was that if he knew that he had these documents, and he had no way of not knowing as an administrator that he had them, it turns out that he wasn't telling the truth about having them. He didn't directly indicate that he didn't have the documents, and he didn't indicate that he did have them. He didn't respond to that inquiry, he avoided answering that question. In fact, if the administrator had honestly said that he had Rago trade documentation, the case about the recovery of 721,000, it probably would have been different. Later when the court reversed that verdict on newly discovered grounds, the case went to review and the court dismissed that lawsuit. The very process of Rago Trade's insolvency was very interesting and very non-typical. There were several things that are completely unusual in any insolvency process. The biggest creditor at the beginning of the process, also the biggest creditor with voting rights, was the State Revenue Service. There was a department in the State Revenue Service that handled the collection processes and thus the insolvency processes. This department was headed by Kaspar Spunkus, the brother of Martin Spunkus. The State Revenue Service, from past experience, never votes at a creditor's meeting to set the administrator's remuneration higher than the legal limit, because the administrator, if he is the administrator of the company, has to work for the remuneration that is available, and reward is not the purpose of his work. It was different in this process. There was one meeting where the administrator was assigned both a fixed fee and an interest fee and so on. At that meeting of creditors, the State Revenue Service was present and abstained from voting. Very unusual. If they had voted against it, there would have been no remuneration. There was another meeting where the reward was reviewed. The remuneration was further increased. The State Revenue Service did not come to that meeting. Of the money that was received in general from other board members, from borrowers, from Rago Trades debtors, almost all the money went to reward Mr. Bunkus and the specialists he brought in, while the creditors received nothing, even at this point in time there is a deficit. Another thing that was also non-typical, the course of the meeting was not properly recorded. The law states that the minutes of the meeting must be kept. Minutes were kept, but those moments that were important and that showed that either the State Revenue Service or Mr. Bunkus were behaving inadequately and incorrectly, they were all not reflected in the minutes. Well, all of this was done, in my opinion, for a certain purpose, to avoid any supervisory agencies getting full information about what was going on. The third block was quite interesting. At one point, Mr. Ullman decided to settle accounts with all the creditors. He proposed a reorganization of the company. Mr. Bunkus wanted to avoid this by all means and made sure that no such decision was made. Then Ullman started buying the rights of claim from some creditors, and paid to the State Revenue Service directly the money owed by Rago Trade to the State Revenue Service. When the SRS received that money, they first included it in the repayment of the debt, but then, according to Mr. Bunkus, the State Revenue Service gave the money back to Ullman. I have never heard of such cases of the SRS returning money to someone who paid for an insolvent company, and all the colleagues I talked to have never heard of such cases either. That is, the State Revenue Service returned the money, gave it up virtually voluntarily. The amount was, I believe, 95,000 euros. Сумма была, по-моему, 95,000 евро. Oleg Gushin. Media manager, mentor, founder of a network of radio stations, a supermarket chain, the company Guran, publisher of Nasha Gazeta, founder of the portal Nasha LV. Oleg Gushin, I've been Mikhail Ullman's partner in various businesses for many years. 
20 years of friendship and communication. He was my mentor. He is the most wonderful, I would say genius person I have ever met in my life, the most talented Latvian businessman I have ever known. A man who started out as a simple cab driver. We spent many of our meetings in his garage, where he repaired his Audi with great love and pleasure. That is a man of a completely different scale, for whom money mean nothing. It is like playing chess for him, simply a process, a pleasure. I'll give you one great example, where Mikhail Oman invested 2 million to develop the Tele2 Express mobile phone network. And suddenly Tele2 says, you know, we don't need any more dealers, we'll sell phones ourselves, just like Apple. That's a net loss of a million and a half. Oman didn't even blink an eye. To think that he could have ordered someone is just crazy. It is clear that this is a raider takeover, they want to quietly cut off, saw off or snatch a piece of his business. Yes, in fact some strong player has attacked, but they don't know who they're playing with. Ullman is Kasparov or Karpov squared. This is like an adventure for him, so there isn't the slightest doubt that Mikhail Oman will come victorious out of this situation. I've been in business for 35 years, and I have witnessed dozens of such scenes, such seizures. This is a regular, common scheme that happens in America, Sweden, Russia or Ukraine. Anybody can do it, hiding behind the state structures. Is anybody offended by this? Not really. Everybody understands the rules of the game. This business is covered up on very high levels. Now, in 2022, after Mr. Oman's detention and arrest, four years later we have information in the press, which only someone who has inside knowledge of the Rago trade process could know, about what are the newly discovered circumstances that led the court to reconsider the case. I can express my opinion as to what purpose, perhaps, such a campaign of black PR against Oman is being carried out now. And the first thing that can be easily seen is that the information from the law enforcement agencies from the moment of Mikhail Oman's detention spread very quickly, which means they were preparing for it. Since the Mono firm has announced a reward for information about the perpetrators, who ordered the murder of Martin Bunkus, we have received some information, a lot of interesting data. This information could suggest other real versions of other orderers and perpetrators. But if Mr. Oman, let's say, had suddenly failed to get out of prison, of course there would be no need to prove his guilt any further. And that would have been the end of the story, that Mr. Oman was the orderer and that's it. Alexei Petrov Citizen of the United States of America, friend, partner and shareholder of Mono Holding. I reasonably fear for Mikhail Oman's life, and I will take all possible and impossible legal measures to save him. I would like to share my grave concern about the fate and life and health of my dear friend Michael Ullman. An organized crime group has organized a vicious attack on the business and life of my friend and that causes an incredible amount of outrage and even a grave concern on my behalf and as an American citizen I swear that we will do everything possible to uh, make sure that the people involved in this vicious attack on the business and on the life of my friend will be punished. We're going to involve congressmen and senators of the United States to investigate this enormously illegal activity that is going on in Latvia. We thought that Latvia was a member of the European Union and a legal state where rule of law is prevailing which we see that is not so we are writing letters to the congressmen we're writing letters to senators we will involve u.s law enforcement in form of the letters to the cia and we will get to the bottom of this and we will investigate the people involved so the amount of this raider attack on the company is really outrageous we are very very angry and we will bring this to justice. So don't make any mistake in terms of us being weak, us being not able to prosecute. We will do this and we will involve the top people in the United States to do this. We are with you, Michael. We stand behind you and we will get you out of this. Free Ullman. Yanis Salmanis. 
A sworn lawyer and certified tax expert with more than 20 years of international experience, managing and providing professional services to a wide range of clients in various business sectors. Yanis is known in the business community as an influential value-added professional, providing advice on mergers, acquisitions and reorganizations, as well as tax and commercial law matters. His absolute knowledge and experience of local and international law make him one of the most quoted personalities in the business media. Since 2006, Yanis is the honorary consul of Malta in Latvia. This case has had a very high resonance. The police are doing their job. They have announced very loudly in the media that it is all clear to them, they have collected the evidence. But no charges have been brought yet, as we know. At the moment, the strictest preventive measure is being applied, almost two months since the man has been in custody. As we know, the most high-profile cases in Latvia are corruption in the Riga City Council and the Martinsons case. The suspects were kept in prison, in custody for almost six months. A preventive measure, as we remember from the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, should never be used as a punishment. I am therefore waiting with great interest to see how quickly the police will finish their work and the prosecution will be able to press charges, because only then can the lawyers finally get down to the real work. At the moment, we have nothing to work with, except that we are working with the revocation and the modification of Mr. Ullman's preventive measure. Of course, what I was very concerned about and, as a lawyer, surprised by, is the media hype. The louder the media hype, the murkier the case. When a suspect is paraded in front of the cameras in handcuffs, making a show of it, that is the first sign that the case is not good. When a person is put in detention for a long time, for example, in maximum security, it also has a certain psychological effect, and it shows that things are not right. And if you look at all these loudest cases, where there have been media campaigns, what have they ended up with? You can check, but I think that at least 90%, if not all 95, ended up with exactly nothing. Of course, it's unfair to treat one of the wealthiest people in Latvia this way. It will be difficult, however, to find a judge who can look at this professionally and objectively. After all, no one has abolished the presumption of innocence, nor, as I said, that a preventive measure cannot be a punishment. What also strikes me is that, in most of these manifestations, the radio shows, television reports, there is only one point of view, and absolutely no alternative versions are put forward at all. The detention did not take place a week after the murder. We are now talking about a crime that has been under investigation for four years. Consequently, the case should have gone very smoothly, things should have moved forward in a month at the latest. Well, I think it is now time for the indictment and the trial to proceed. It's so bad.